welcome UTD alumni, faculty, staff, students, and community friends to the Johnson School's Dimensions of Diversity event. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Megan Hogan, um, and I am the Chief Diversity Officer of Goldman Sachs. I get asked this question a lot, so I thought I would uh, answer it, um, given that we don't have time for Q&A, and that's why is diversity and inclusion important to me? Um, so I'm a first generation college student. I identify as a woman, black and Latina. Um, and my mother's family came here from the Dominican Republic in the 40s and 50s, escaping what was then um, a regime uh, full of fear um, and hatred against the population, um, escaping tyranny from the then dictator of the country, Rafael Trujillo. My parents and my grandparents came here for better opportunities. Um, and what was always at the center of that was educational opportunity. Although they had undergraduate and graduate degrees in the Dominican Republic, they weren't recognized here in the United States. They had to start all over again. Um, and for many years, my grandfather ended up working in a cigar factory, although he had been a professor in Samana, a small uh, village outside of Punta Cana. Um, given that his educational status uh, meant nothing when he came here to the United States. And so education has always been at the center of our family, how we think about prosperity, how we think about building future generations of wealth for our family, um, and how we build a sphere of influence um, and make sure that we're building other communities up in this space. Um, and so that's part of the reason why I do what I do um, in the diversity and inclusion space and why I'm so excited to be here today, not only speaking to all of you, um, but I really take pleasure in the fact that so many universities, institutions and companies that I meet with on a daily basis have really turned their attention towards what it means to advance diversity and inclusion. Um, it's important to how we think about driving innovation across the United States. Um, and how we make sure that, you know, for the next generation of talent that comes into the Johnson School, that they know that it's not a moral imperative, but quite frankly, a business imperative for the school and their students. And so a couple of things I wanted to highlight that are really exciting um, at Goldman Sachs these days is we recently launched our 1 million black women initiative. That's a commitment of 10 billion. That's right with a B, $10 billion in narrowing the economic and opportunity gaps for black women. We're also committing to $100 million in philanthropic capital. The reason I'm so excited is not only am I a member of the steering committee, um, but I'm working with people both outside the firm and our advisory council to really take a holistic view on how we can advance progress. And this is not just about the four walls of Goldman Sachs. This is about communities all across the United States. When we look at the talent life cycle of people you know, here in the US, we have to be thoughtful about birth through retirement. If there are not educational opportunities, we close the door to career opportunities. If we close the door to career opportunities, um, we then close the door to building wealth, um, being able to start businesses, and quite, uh, if you think about it, affecting the global GDP. Um, if we take particularly women and black women out of the economy. Um, and so I'm not excited about this adventure just because it affects me as a black woman, um, but because it's going to help with millions of women across the US. And when we know we lift up black women, we lift up lots of different communities of color as well. And so I hope that you invest time in reading more about this initiative. It's really exciting. Um, we're committing to 10 years of making sure that we're investing our time and our capital and my, our commitments in the right way and making sure that we're holding ourselves accountable um, by making sure that as we assess where our impact has been on an annual basis, we're reporting that all out to um, many of our constituents and stakeholders, including many of you. I do want to turn my attention to the fact that it's been an incredibly unsettling year. Um, we're living in a time where we're facing many crises. We're living with a global pandemic and, and racial equity crisis. Um, and what has been really important for me is to listen and learn from the perspectives, particularly of our Asian community. Um, over the last year, you know, we've been really focused on the fact that we want to bring our people back to the firm safely. 
Um, but quite frankly, how can we do that if we have members of our community who are quite frankly afraid to leave their homes, giving the rising tide of anti-Asian violence and sentiment, particularly here in the US, but unfortunately across the globe um, and in the centers in which we operate. And so over the last six months, I've been doing a lot of listening and learning and figuring out how we can build awareness. This unfortunately is not an episodic moment for the Asian community. There's been incidents of hatred all the way since the Chinese Exclusion Act in the 1880s. And so we really need to take a historical look back on where this country has faltered this community to make sure that it doesn't happen again. We're working with the Ascend Coalition to not only build awareness, but in the moment show how we can be upstanders for this community. What do we do when we see microaggressions or bias or unfortunately violence that might be brought against our Asian colleagues, um, both within uh, the communities across New York City, Salt Lake City, and unfortunately Dallas, but quite frankly, globally. Um, and what we're learning in this moment is that this concept of just listening and building empathy is the biggest pathway for us to uh, advance inclusion at the firm. And so there's a lot of headway to be done there. Um, but what I've been really pleased with is the feedback from the community saying, we know that Goldman Sachs is standing in solidarity with us uh, to make sure that we feel heard, that we do not feel invisible, um, and that we feel protected from bias, especially when it comes to our colleagues. Um, and so I would encourage all of you to be checking in you know, with your, your colleagues, your fellow students, uh, to make sure that there are things that you can do, not only in the moment, but in the future, to make sure that they feel as though you're standing in solidarity with them as well. I also do want to highlight um, that we're extremely focused um, on the Dallas community. You may have seen the press on the fact that a couple of our more senior leaders across the firm, particularly from engineering, our, our consumer business, have been making visits to Dallas and will continue to do so. We have aspirations to hire about 200 engineering roles into our consumer business that sit in UT Dallas's backyard in Richardson. Um, those 200 engineering roles are just a small piece of the firm's commitment to grow our presence from what is about approximately 2,100 employees to over 5,000 in the Dallas, Richardson, and Irving area. Um, and so speaking of bias, I'm quite biased myself. Um, when I think about the opportunities at Goldman Sachs, and I think um, there's tremendous growth that we're having in the area, and I hope that you'll take part in learning more about what we can offer as you think about your next career path. We know that UT Dallas, specifically the Johnson School, will continue to be a tremendous feeder of talent, and that's why we're really pleased to announce that we are launching a partnership to provide scholarships for computer science students. We will provide two $10,000 scholarships to students from the Johnson School for the next academic year. We're really excited about the opportunity to make sure that we can fund uh, talent as they pursue their educational careers. Like I said, I'm a first generation college student myself, and I probably would have fallen out of my chair if anyone told me they were handing over $10,000 for me. Um, in my first year um, of undergrad and my second year as well, I work two part-time jobs um, to get through school. Um, and when I think about that, you know, certainly it built the grit within me to pursue future opportunities, but it was challenging um, to be working and uh, juggling uh, my academics during undergrad. Um, it also doesn't, doesn't, didn't necessarily afford me the opportunity to think about what I could do uh, to pursue you know, internships, to connect with the likes of Goldman Sachs at career fairs because I was spending a ton of my time working as opposed to learning more about all of the opportunity sets that financial services, engineering, technology firms, consulting could afford me. Um, and so we know that these scholarships are meaningful and, and we're really proud to partner with Johnson on, on giving those scholarships this year. And so um, I want to say that personally, I've been so thrilled um, to hear from our recruiters that their time with UT Dallas students is well spent. Um, I do certainly want to make the move down there in the next couple of months to be meeting with all of you, being able to connect with you. But in the meantime, um, certainly reach out to me on LinkedIn and via email if you want to hear more about Goldman Sachs and any connections that I can personally make for you to learn more about what roles we have here at the firm for you.
And so with that, um, I would love to turn it over to Dr. Stephanie Adams, who is the fifth dean of the Johnson School of Engineering and Computer Science at UT Dallas. Um, but this won't be the last time that you hear from me. Um, and so I look forward to the rest of today's programming and hope to connect with you in the future. Thank you, Megan, for that wonderful, <clears throat> excuse me, wonderful introduction. Um, it, it's, uh, and also thank you to Goldman Sachs for your very generous scholarships on behalf of our computer science students. Um, many of the participants today have been benefactors of the Johnson School, so we thank all of you collectively for your contributions. But as I said, Goldman Sachs's uh, contribution was a new one that we just actually were able to, to share. Um, so my, my challenge this morning, or my task this morning, not challenge, my task this morning is to moderate the panel, but also to talk a little bit about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion at the Johnson School. I've been here about 18 months, and one of the things that I do when I join an organization is I want to get a really good sense of who's there. And so I did a very deep dive into the data of the Johnson School, and I'm very pleased uh, with where we are, but I think there's a lot of room for us to grow. And so when I think about our student populations, um, we're about 17.5% uh, Hispanic in the Johnson School, just shy of 5% African American in the Johnson School. We're a little, right around 20% women. And so when you look at the national averages for students studying engineering and computer science, we're above average for uh, Hispanic and African American students, but we're a little bit behind average uh, for women. And then I look at our faculty. And I think that our faculty should be reflective of our student population. And right now they're not. And so we've got some work to do there. But beyond um, the people who are in the room, which is what to me what diversity means, it's how do they feel when they're in the room? Do they feel valued? Do they feel included? Do they feel heard? Do they feel as if they belong? And so when I look across the Johnson School and I talk with students, faculty, and staff, I hear that we have some work to do with regards to our inclusion in the Johnson School. And so for me, as the new dean, I have set some very aggressive uh, goals for our, our student demographics, but I also have been wanting to align ourselves with our corporate partners who have been a little bit, maybe a little bit better than we have or a little bit more advanced than we have been to learn best practices from our partners. And so that's why it's so important to me today that we have this incredible slate of distinguished executives from some of our biggest partners to share their thoughts about DEI and where we, sh where we should be going and the things that we should think about so that we, we too in the Johnson School can learn. Uh, and as I said, all of these <clears throat> women have been advocates and their companies have been advocates and supporters of the Johnson School. I also know that we have a number of alumni with us today and we wanna make sure that we leverage our advocates. When, you, when you're an alum, you're an advocate, right? So people, you're gonna talk about your experience as a student at the Johnson School, whether you got a bachelor's degree, master's degree, or PhD, you're an advocate and an ambassador. And so we would love to, um, you know, be able to talk with how we can create safe places in the Johnson School for you and then how you can help us leverage that. And I'll just give you a quick example that came up uh, two weeks ago. Um, in one of my departments, they have an industrial advisory board and they were having an industrial advisory board meeting and our department head there was talking about DEI matters. And one of his board members said, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to hear that this is the focus of the Johnson School. I'm a person who identifies from the LGBTQ um, community and when I was a student, I didn't hear a voice for me. I didn't hear anybody talking about this. I didn't feel as though I could bring my whole self to school every day. And I mean, I just think about how unfortunate that must be uh, when someone can't do that. And so that's an, important for us. And so it was nice to have that feedback from an alum that, that lets me know we're on the right track. You know, we're thinking about and having the right kinds of conversations. Um, so. Again, we're going to offer you at the end of our time today some, um, some ways in which alumni can engage, but some ways in which our students, faculty, staff can engage. So I don't want to take any more time setting the stage. I really want to get to the panelists. I want to hear what, what they have to say and, and how their organizations have been thinking about this very important topic and, and what they, they themselves uh, think about the topic. And so it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Um, first, we have Nancy Flores, 
who is the Chief Information and Chief Technology Officer for McKesson. Um, thank you, Nancy, for joining us. Um, next, we'll have Terry Hatcher, who is the T Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer from NTT Data. Thank you, Terry, for joining us. And I always chuckle when I see your name because it makes me think about the woman who played Lois Lane in Superman. And I'm like, wait, Terry Hatcher. Um, and then last but certainly not least, we have Maya, Lieb Maya Liebman, who is coming to us really from a plane, and she's going to give us our safety demonstration at any point in time. But Maya is the Executive Vice President and Chief Information Officer from American Airlines, and American Airlines has been a, a tremendous partner, as has NTT, and McKesson is coming on board. So, ladies, I'm pleased to welcome each of you um, to our panel this morning. And I'm going to throw out the first question. Um, and if the first question for the audience is, each of you leads Fortune 500 and 100 companies here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, many known globally for being inclusive places to work. What role do you believe that diversity, equity, and inclusion plays in the evolution and the future of your company? And so we don't all fumble our, over ourselves. I'm just going to pick on Nancy to go first. And we'll go Nancy, Maya, and then Terry. Thank you, Dr. Adams. Now, happy to be here and um, happy to be in Dallas. Um, it, I think we all know the obvious answer is diversity plays a critical role. But when you think about um, how you tie it back to making a difference, um, when you look at the mission, especially for McKesson, what we do in the healthcare space, um, our mission is to improve lives um, all the way down to the patient through one product, one um, and uh, one patient at a time. And so when you think about that and you think about our entire population, the US population, 25% is um, people of color. And when you think of the areas that need the most healthcare and most improvement in healthcare, it's in the underserved communities. So when you think about what diversity means to us, it actually really means um, reflecting what our customers look like. Um, in the areas we serve, whether it's uh, pharmaceutical solutions through technology, whether it's supporting pharmaceutical manufacturers um, through clinical trials, all of those areas have huge impact um, of having appropriate representation of diversity um, in, er in everything we do. So when you look at the bigger picture, it's fundamentally important um, to us from a culture standpoint. Um, and I think we talked a little bit about this pre in, in our pre-call, um, um, having employees represent our customer having employees represent the communities we look like just brings better solutions um, and better better perspectives in how we do everything every day. So um, it's fundamental to our culture, it's fundamental to how we recruit, um, and it's fundamental to how we build our leadership today. Thank you so very much. Uh, Maya. Yeah, I will um, echo uh, what Nancy said, you know, and she talked about the mission of McKesson, you know, the mission at American is around connecting people. It's around, you know, creating value, you know, a, a great experience for customers and helping them on life's journey. And we, when we say that, we mean all customers, we mean everyone and all of our team members as well. It's not just certain groups. And so diversity plays, uh, DE and I, the whole concept plays a really, really large role. Um, you know, I would say there was a time when I, I would have said we talked about it a lot, but it was probably more lip service than action. Um, what I'm really proud of is in the last couple of years, um, really translating that uh, into real tangible improvements as we see things like, um, you know, sponsorship programs for our black team members actual representation goals to ensure that we have black representation and diverse representation in our leadership groups, um, bringing in a community council to help us and help us see the perspective of black and diverse uh, customers when they interact with our product, uh, listening sessions, um, you know, uh, bias training, but not just bias training, but taking that into behavior. Who, who's, you know, who are you hiring? Who are you sponsoring? Diverse supplier efforts, recruiting for diversity. I mean, I, there's, you know, you talked about how few people are going, how few black and um, diverse teams members are going into computer science degrees um, that makes it hard for us to recruit those folks so we need to start earlier before they get into college um, when they're younger and make sure that these are uh, careers that they're going to choose one of the really fun things that we do is a hackathon 
um, along with Black Enterprise. Um, it's a great opportunity for uh, for the kids. They get to do really fun things. They're mostly all from HBCUs. And then we have the opportunity to um, to see how they do uh, and and then hire them directly after having seen you know their computer science skills. Thank you, Nancy. And before we go to Terry, I just wanted to just offer a personal note. I actually had a chance last fall to participate as a speaker in your um, hackathon co-sponsored with Black Enterprises. And that was just an incredible opportunity and the energy that the students had. So, so thank you as a product of a HBCU. Thank you guys, American Airlines, for, for offering that. And the students got won some phenomenal prizes. I was jealous. I'm not a computer scientist, but I wanted to go back to school and figure out something so I could start coding. So thanks for that effort, um, uh, Maya and American Airlines. Terry, would you please answer the question? Sure, yeah. Well, um, for NTT Data, um, as an IT services company, innovation is primary for us. It's imperative that we continue to um, increase our ability to leverage and grow diverse talent um, to continue to fuel innovative solutions for a variety of clients. So. Um, as you know, having diverse talent is is just one thing. Um, building and sustaining an environment where our talent feels the freedom, the empowerment, the support to bring their best self uh, and their best to work to the table. Uh, that's where the inclusion and the belonging that you hear about, that's where that comes in. And so we are uh, working to be even better at finding diverse talent. Um, and also in, in making sure that the talent that we bring in, um, and when we find it, we talk about finding it even internally too. How do we elevate our internal talent and make um, people of uh, a diverse group of people um, visible to, to everyone in the, in the company that may be needing certain positions uh, filled, et cetera. So finding diverse talent internally, externally, um, retaining that diverse talent and growing that talent. Um, as a result, we are continually looking at our processes, our tools, um, new processes and tools to support uh, where we're trying to go in building that inclusive uh, environment for our future. So I'm always looking to, to do better in that area. But what I'm really proud to, to say um, is that our leadership is uh, all of our leadership is, is all in on this. They're supportive, they're engaged um, in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our employee base sees that, and that's so important. When they get on these our global all-hands calls, they can see our leaders talking about diversity and what they're doing within their business areas to support that. And they can also see um, in our employee resource groups, we have very active employee resource groups um, and we're new in that journey, but this has been a real energizer for us um, because our, our executives, they get they go into these events, they get on the calls, they're participating um, in the chats and asking questions and um, and employees, frankly, sometimes are are surprised to see that. Um, but again, that shows that that our executives are are all in. Um, but again, I as I say, we're we're early in that journey. Um, and Though even even some companies are not early in the journey, um, I think this last year has really encouraged many companies to review, reset, maybe start over in their diversity, equity, and inclusion journeys to really question themselves to see are they doing the things that can really make a difference and and change the future for that for that company. So. Um, that's important. You, you cannot take your eye off the ball in this space. We found that there's so many things that affect your efforts. Every reorg that you do, every acquisition that you do, every new senior leader hire um, can make a difference. They can have an impact to your culture. One leader can impact the culture of a company and cause you to accelerate or go backwards in your efforts in DE and I. So um, really important that, and that's something that all companies and we are continually looking at uh, what those actions are and really working to hold ourselves, our leaders, uh, hiring managers, et cetera, um, accountable. So it's an important journey for us. We realize that 
um, but we're excited and, and it's been a lot of fun too. So thank you. Thank you, Terry. And I like that we're, as, a, as a mechanical engineer by training, I, lo I love the connection accelerate, right? We, have, we, we talk about acceleration all the time in, in engineering. So I never thought about connecting it with, with DEI, but I like that. So I, I might borrow that. I'll give you attribution, of course. Thank you. <laughs> um, question two, and Maya, I'd like to, like to ask you to lead off, followed by Terry and then Nancy. Um, we all know that research proves that having a more diverse team leads to greater productivity, revenue, and ultimate success, as many of you have touched on. Um, can, can you, are, are there anything, any additional examples you'd like to share uh, from a firsthand experience about your own company as to how it's been beneficial? Sure. Um, there is no question. The research is super clear that companies that really embrace DE&I have better profitability, better customer satisfaction, better employee satisfaction, you know, and we see it ourselves, you know, having people with different perspectives, it makes us stronger, it makes us more innovative, it makes us better problem solvers um, because we approach things with different backgrounds, with different perspectives, and that leads to a more interesting uh, solution set. So here's an example where I think um, having people of different backgrounds and different races in the room made us end up with a better solution. At American, we are implementing a lot of AI and machine learning, just like everybody else. One of the things that we're excited about is the promise of facial recognition. Because um, let, I'll give you one use case that we have, and that is boarding for an international departure. So um, when you board for an international departure, you not only need to pull out your boarding pass, but also your passport and it leads to a really slow process to get people onto the plane. When we use facial recognition, um, because we have the passport information, um, people can just literally walk straight onto the plane. They don't need to interact with the gate agent. They also don't need to take anything out of their pockets. And we're able to board a wide body aircraft. Um, we did some tests. We, we were able to do one in 17 minutes. Um, it was, you know, we're all congratulating ourselves and saying how great this is. And then we have some some black team members and some people, um, some other people of color who said, hey, listen, this facial recognition isn't, you know, isn't something that um, is appealing to people from my community. Um, number one, we've all seen a about a lot of the bias that can be inherent in a lot of these machine learning and algorithmic tools. And in addition, these tools in my community have meant surveillance and they've, they're they really evocative of a troubled relationship between police and communities of color. So we need to provide an opportunity for people to opt out of this. And if they don't wanna go through the facial recognition, we need to provide them another opportunity to board the plane. Um, I think that's one great example of where we have seen diversity make us better. Thank you. Terry? Uh, yeah, I would. Absolutely agree. It's in some ways it's um, it's a scary space. The, the whole piece of artificial intelligence. Um, many companies will incorporate artificial intelligence in some way in their development of products or services. Um, and as we've all been hearing, certainly there's some ethical concerns um, and and concerns as as Maya mentioned about inherent biases. So, as a service company, we are really trying to get our constituents to think deeply about their data. Where is it coming from? How is it being collected? Um, because AI is driven off of data. And so if there are biases inherent in the data, in the processes used to collect the data, the data will likely come out in an AI solution um, that is biased if it's not mitigated. And so um, we have to really in, uh, insist on diverse teams when you're looking at these these AI solutions um, and developing the products and, and the services to increase the probability of having a, a positive result for all, for, for everyone. Um, NTT Data recently, um, we've been part of a founding coalition called the Alliance for Global Inclusion. And um, of the four focus areas, uh, we have a focus area for inclusive product development because we're really committed to as a as a tech industry, um, the companies that are part of the, the coalition are tech companies and, and tech adjacent companies. Um, and we feel passionate uh, and committed to really leveraging 
the existing intervention points uh, in AI product development um, to mitigate bias and really embed DNI considerations into the full AI product lifecycle. That is so important. Um, you've got to have diverse teams looking at that, but it's also starting with your um, companies at the very base of where that data is coming from. So all of that we feel is going to be so important. So I say to to, the, to those of you who are out in companies and um, to students who are who are learning about this, um, we really need to to push for the DNI considerations in the entire life cycle and even before the product development at the data point. So um, yeah, absolutely imperative in this space right now for everyone. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I, I think in an extension, I have two thoughts, um, an extension of Maya and Terry, you know, data does become very important. And in um, the, the role we play for the country right now in terms of COVID administration, that data has been powerful um, on two fronts of understanding where um, vaccines have been dis, um, distributed and marrying that up with local communities that were in need um, of vaccines from um, underserved communities. Combining that with our health mark um, pharmacies, 60% of our pharmacies sit in underserved communities. So we were able to use that data to work with um, the US government and re, um, reallocate those distributions to try um, and get better um, distribution to underserved areas. So that's one example, but I do believe, um, I think it's a big topic in the area of tech and data, making sure that data um, is representative of the population you serve. Um, but I kind of go back to uh, just a more fundamental comment um, that I believe, Terry, you made early on is, you know, the example of what really matters in changing um, uh, the, the culture at a company to, to be diverse and inclusive. Really, we're all putting the processes in place. We're all doing best practices. We're all leveraging talent. We get it. Um, but I think when I talk to my leadership and my staff is what really matters is actually what you come into the office and do every single day. And I talk about persistence and courage to actually take action. And um, the example I give, I've been at McKesson for 16 months. Um, when I walked in, my 10 direct reports were primarily white and mostly men and a few women. Um, I made a decision to rebuild some of that talent. Um, and in the last year, I now have representation across African-American, Hispanic, Asian, um, and specifically Asian and Indian. And in that moment alone, um, in three months, we took 100 headcount and doubled our percentages in terms of people of color. We were, we were pretty good on females, but just in that management level, we have a lot of work to do because we're in single digits. Um, but just that to me is a perfect example where the leadership you build, the culture you, you want to have in your organization and how you want to operate as a company starts with the leadership. And just by hiring a Hispanic CTO overnight um, um, understood a completely different perspective of how you build a team. Um, having um, an African-American CISO um, overnight, you know, and just to kind of being transparent, um, we can't get good talent um, for tech. We can't get this talent. Um, that was no longer a discussion when recruiting and talent because we brought a broader perspective of different pools of talent, different criteria of what good look like, um, and naturally, um, that has built a completely different focus of how we're building our organization. And that to me, I call it a segment of one, every day you go in and you make an intentional impact um, to apply um, inclusiveness and diversity into every decision you make. To me, that's the most important thing of, of what's making <coughs> it. It's not the, the processes and the numbers are great, um, but those are outcomes that we want to, to leverage but it's actually what we do every day as leaders um, and having the courage to stand up and, and stand up for somebody else. Thank you. And so Nancy, it, I was sitting here, I thought of a question as each of you spoke about this one and I wasn't sure if I was gonna ask it, but after you just spoke, I'm, I'm actually gonna insert a question that we didn't give you in advance because I think it's relevant here. Um, and so, you know, you talked about looking at different criteria and not having the same answers. And so the question that was sort of mulling around in my head, oftentimes I hear people say, 
when you bring in more diverse people, you lower your quality. Uh. And I go back and think about what Megan said at the beginning as she told her story about being a first generation college student and having grit and all, you know, and, and the various things that go into it. And we know the world was never fair, right? There's schools today that some kids can't get calculus, no matter how smart they are, their school just doesn't offer calculus. And so if you look at certain criteria as who you decide is admissible to engineering, you might miss some people. So I would love to hear, I would love to hear your perspectives around this notion that somehow diversity lowers quality or having having different kinds of criteria for how you search for certain positions or the way in which you recruit talent. That doesn't mean you're compromising your standards. It means that you're aware enough to recognize that you got to do things differently to attract certain types of people. So I, I know it wasn't a scripted question, but if any of you want to share your thoughts about that, I think our audience would love to hear that. At least I know I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. I'm pretty passionate about that one. Um, you know, growing up, I did come from, uh, my mom was first a uh, first generation immigrant and didn't, English was not her first language. My dad, um, while well, he um, he's Mexican, he was born here. He spent a lot of time of his years in, in Tijuana, Mexico growing up. And um, when you look for opportunity, you know, growing up um, in a generation, what's great is our younger generation now, they don't have the challenges we all grew up in, but when you're constantly told, you know, you're not good enough or, you know, you're a female, you should, especially coming from a Mexican culture where, you know, family's important, you should be at home raising the children. Um, my dad taught me that the, the most important thing um, that makes you is uh, your education. Nobody can take that away. And um, when I was in college, I actually wanted to go into medical school. Um, my first year chemistry teacher told me it was no place for a female because it was too much work and to have a family, you couldn't do it. Um, so I changed my major. Um, then I was accepted to a PhD program in statistics and my first year probability um, teacher told me that my commute was too long, it was too hard, and as a female, um, I should reconsider my degree, and I dropped out. Um, in hindsight, I, I, you know, I live life with no rest, but in hindsight, um, what, I, what I accepted was the ignorance um, of somebody's perspective and their fear of, of not understanding a different perspective. And so I passionately believe um, it's not uh, less than, it's actually you're missing so much opportunity. Um, it, it's cultural differences of, of clearing the way to actually bring forward the intelligence and the wisdom um, and the brilliance of, of many people. So, so I'm pretty passionate about uh, it. That's unacceptable. And actually, you know, when we talk about it at my staff, we re-review key talent that comes through. Um, you know, I, I I really look and challenge my team about what, how might we make them successful? You know, they may not have come through interviewing. You know, if you go to a, a, a prestigious school, they teach you how to interview, they teach you what to do. You know, I, I, I had to work while I went to college, as many of us did. You didn't have the time to do that. So cultural norms of not using the right word, what you need to wear, um, those are not criteria for how smart you are. Those are just social perceptions of what you think might be good. So. Um, so I'm pretty passionate about those. those it's, it's out of ignorance. It's really out of education, and um, we all have to be willing to learn. So, but I'm 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 very passionate about that. Do either Meyer Meyer or Terry want to offer something on that? I'll I'll jump in real quick. Um, you know, the, there was somebody who worked for me. This was a long time ago, and we were really trying to improve our representation. And they said well, do you want me to hire the diverse person or the best person? And I was like, yes, and yes, this person doesn't work for me anymore. Um, but it was like, how can you possibly tell me that the diverse person isn't also the best person? I mean, that's just, that, that's ignorance talking, just like Nancy said. Um, but I, the case I want to use when we talk about recruiting, and Stephanie, I think you're familiar with this program that we're doing with the Dallas Independent School District, where we are the sponsor of an early college program at one of the high schools in South Dallas. And four years ago, we went, we selected a group of about 60 freshmen. Um, they were selected 
selected based on their attitude and aptitude. Half of them are women, almost all of them are Hispanic. And we put them through a four year program where when they graduate, uh, along with the community college, El Centro, when they graduate, they will have both their high school degree and their associate's degree, their two year community college degree, which they got essentially for free and with a specialization in technology. Technology. Well, now they're seniors. They're going to graduate in just a few weeks and we're hiring them. They're going to do a summer internship this year. And then when they do a four year program, when they start that in the fall, they'll go to a part time position with us. And so we're going to hire them this summer. You know, my sense is that they're probably going to be making more than anyone in that family has made. And um, so we're going to really interrupt the cycle of under earning in these communities. Plus, the, these kids are fabulous. They didn't lack aptitude they didn't lack attitude they lacked opportunity and so now we've created that opportunity for them and i can't wait for them to get here and really show up a lot of the people that i have already because they're going to come in with so much enthusiasm and excitement and passion um that that it's it's going to be really lovely to see i can't wait thank you terry i i think that's fantastic because it's a good way Maya what you're talking about for for people to see that when when you are high when you're going through the interviewing process um don't always go with what you're familiar with you know someone who went to the same school as you or someone who went to another ivy league school with you or someone who plays cello and you play cello or you're not looking for the familiar and sometimes when people are uh, i think um hiring managers leaders um, they're gravitating towards what they know, what they're comfortable with, uh, people that they've had in their organization before. And so it may not, it, it may be fine to have some things in common, but those are not the basic qualifications of the role. And so I think it's so important that in a company, um, what we're working to do with our leaders is um, helping them to be better interviewers and, and better within the, the whole hiring process um, and more comfortable with um, people who may not look like them or have the same, what the, perceive them as having the same background, um, those types of things. And so that they'll begin to, to think differently about uh, the qualifications and also be sure that you're applying the same set of qualifications the same way to all of the candidates. I think it's sometimes um, you're willing to excuse something again if you see someone who has something in common with you. And so we're really helping really right now through training, working with um, leaders to understand the importance of the interview process in uh, ensuring diversity. Um, and and really important too, I would say for for women and and others where you you know you feel like you may not have as much of a chance, um, you got to put yourself out there and go for a position because you have more to offer than you think. So whether you're a person with disabilities or again a woman, someone from the LGBT community, put yourself out there um, and know that you have more to offer than what you than what you think and work with someone to help you bring that out and, and be more bold about speaking on your own behalf. Because uh, in general, I think we we've seen um, that men will apply for some, a position a lot faster than a woman will um, or, or a person of color or someone who may be from um, a, a different a background where they feel like, you know, well, my background's not going to match most of the people that might be going. You kind of talk yourself out of it before you even try. And so, again, I would say don't do that. You have more to offer than you think um, to bring to that table. And then it's up to the hiring manager and that whole process to keep diversity in mind, unconscious biases, microaggressions, <laughs> All of that comes into play when you're going through that interview process so that you're looking at people the same way and truly looking at the best qualifications. And not worrying about diversity and, and quotas and whatever, which which is a horrible way to look at that. Um, so that would that would be my my say in that. And, and it is a passionate, I think, point for a lot of people too. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you for the unsolicited question. <laughs> 
Um, so our, our next uh, question before we go to the questions from some of our, our registrants today, and I think some of you have touched on it, but I want to give any of you a chance to um, expand on your previous answers um, in the sense of what, uh, what do you believe the consequences for our world and community are if we do not embrace and pursue diversity and inclusion in the workplace? And I know uh, we talked a little bit about the AI machine learning aspect, but are there other areas? I mean, you guys, are, I know you're all sort of in the IT type space, but but Nancy, your company, you know, does medical healthcare types of issues. And so maybe there are other things that someone would like to offer. So I think on that one, we'll start with um, Terry and then we'll have Nancy and then Maya. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I, it's going to be important, as, as we all know, um, in a lot of different ways, but for, for us, it can come down to revenue. Um, now, and it's, it's a wonderful thing, but now many companies more and more are looking to see if the partners that they choose really value diversity and inclusion. Um, and so they may give us a whole page of questions to answer in that um, in a, a request for a proposal or just at the beginning of a process just to see what kind of company we are. Are we walking the talk They're, You know, they're going to be checking into things and checking to see what kind of partner we are. And frankly, um, what we found is if you don't measure up to that, it'll take you out of the running right from the beginning. So so that in general is going to obviously affect um, your your revenue. Uh, they're looking for that. They will call you out if you walk into a room and that team is not reflective of what they feel their customer base is, their their company <laughs> population. Um, they will call you out on it. They, they may say, well, we don't you know, where are the women in your on your team? They will say it right right to you. And so it's important for companies to really take this seriously for a lot of different reasons. As I said, for, for uh, helping to boost innovation and your ability to bring the best solution because you have a diverse team helping to develop that solution, all the way to making sure that your company and your ideas are reflective of a, of a whole population. We're a global company. So things that we're doing here in the US, they're not the same things that we're doing um, or that it may be important to companies that are based in, you know, EMEA in uh, the European areas or in Latin America. So we, we really have to be mindful of, um, again, diversity in more ways than just what we might think of in the US as ethnicity, et cetera. You really, you really need to think further than that about that population, that region of the world, and what's important to them when you're developing your solutions. Thank you. Uh, Nancy? Yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, diversity is key for um, every company going forward. I think when you think about the sensitivity of what's happened in the world um, today, when there has been um, something that's happened in the media, in the community, um, there is a new expectation for companies um, to act based on integrity, um, based on its role um, in a broader socioeconomic environment. And I think um, in order to compete and be successful um, going forward, it, it's, it's a non-negotiable now. Um, there's an expectation um, of integrity. There's an expectation of serving the community that, that wasn't here 20 years ago. Um, and when you think about some a company like McKesson, um, we offer solutions in the healthcare space. I've talked a little bit about how you know we want to have the ad ad accurate representation of our customers. But when you think of our most important assets, it's our human capital. 50,000 of our employees are distribution workers. Um, and as as talent becomes more scarce, as our you know population becomes older and we have less talent coming into the workforce, they have choices. And they have choices. And a lot of um, what we talk about internally is um, when we hire people, um, people that we hire want to be part of our mission because of the culture we have. But people will have choices if it's not a company that they feel is inclusive, representative of what they believe, um, you're not going to be able to compete um, from that standpoint. I also think fundamentally, you can't turn your beliefs on or off, whether you're at home or at work. 
Um, and, you know, if you're going to set an expectation, really have that culture to change the world um, and achieve a mission, not just at work, um, you got to have the right people that believe in it, that inclusiveness. Um, and they come to work and that's fundamentally who they are and they go home and that's fundamentally who they are. So it's, you know, it's not an option anymore. It's, it's not an option anymore to me. Thank you, Maya. Sorry about that. Um, I, uh, I'll i just boil it down to four, four points. Um, the consequences are big, starting sort of at the micro. Look, the future is technology. What I say here is that there's almost nothing that happens at the airline on a daily basis that doesn't involve technology. And I'm sure that that's true for all of the companies represented here. We already don't have enough people in technology. When Megan from Goldman Sachs was saying she's going to hire 200 people in Dallas and, you know, com computer engineers, I was like, oh, no, more competition. Um, by not embracing diversity, we are losing a big portion of the population who have the attitude and the aptitude, but not necessarily the opportunity. The second is we're going to miss stuff. You know, I gave you the example of the facial recognition. If we don't have diverse teams, we are going to miss those things and we are going to have suboptimal solutions. The third thing is that if we don't really embrace this and get good, not just at diversity, but at the inclusion and at the equity sides of that, we people are not going to be able to do their best work people my black team members tell me all the time about the mask that they have to wear the mask that they put on in the morning so that they can come to work they change the way they dress they change the way they talk they change the way they react to things because that's what they have to do to fit in and if you're any, expending that much psychic energy on tailoring you and who you are, then you can't invest that in doing good work. And, um, and, and we can't have people coming to work and not feeling like they can be their true and authentic selves because then they won't do their best work. And finally, you know, going all the way to the macro level, we are suffering as a country. This is a really, really challenging time. And if we don't embrace that, we are never going to grow as a country. Thank, thank you. And so now we'll turn to some questions from the registrant. So <clears throat> from Allison Weaver, who's a UT Dallas alum, Allison wants to know, has your organization issued a diversity and inclusion report assessing your performance in this area and what actions you've taken to rectify any deficiencies? Anyone want to take that one? Uh, since I'm still unmuted, I'll go quickly. We have like a 230 page report uh, outlining that we had done uh, by external auditors to come in and look at all of the things that we're doing well, all of the things that we're, don't, we're not doing well. It led to like an 80 point plan. Um, we've boiled that down into sort of nine things that we communicate externally. A lot of them I've already rattled off, everything from supplier diversity to our sponsorship program to representation goals. Um, and we talk about that publicly. Thank you. Anyone else want to offer? Yeah, this is Nancy. We're doing the same. We're at, we actually debated um, what to publish and what to communicate. Um, and it was on the basis of we did not want to set a tone of we're, we're, we're going for a number. That was not the tone. So we actually um, report, we actually just by, by regulatory requirements, we have to report a number of diversity measures. Um, but we're trying to be much more thoughtful around um, what intention and outcomes we're trying to achieve. So. Um, we have internal goals. We've actually made that a key priority in terms of our top five. Um, we talk about it in our investor calls and it's in our it's in our annual report. But I think all companies are trying to figure out the balance between numbers versus um, a good intent and, and what we're trying to achieve. Thank you, Terry. Yeah, um, for NTT data, we have some information that we always have out on our external site because we have a, an external diversity and inclusion site. So anyone can go out there, they can see what our um, general um, representation numbers are. So we, we have that information out there and, and we keep that updated. Um, but the other piece is again, through um, our involvement with the Alliance for Global Inclusion, um, we're actually holding ourselves, the, the members of the coalition, accountable for making that information public because part of what we're doing is 
is really hoping to guide other companies um, at whatever stage they're in, small, big, uh, large efforts, small efforts, wh wherever they are in their journey to help uh, guide them um, and help them to look at us as a, as a tech industry um, to give them somewhat of a, a standard or again, a guideline for that. So um, that, and, and we're also asking companies to um, get involved with the coalition. So it's, it's, it's tech companies, but um, also tech adjacent. I mean, what company, as Maya said, what company is not involved at some level in technology? We, we all are. So um, we're always looking for, for others to, to join us in that area and make sure that, um, you know, we're sharing our, our, our vision, our goals, and, and where we're going within the tech industry, again, to be a guide for others. And so um, we hope people will go out there and take a look. We have an index out there that can help any company right now um, in looking at their, their diversity and inclusion um, metrics. And so uh, encourage folks to take a look. Thank you. So I, I love this next question from, um, one of our high school students, Jonathan Hartfield. And uh, so Jonathan says, how important is a high school student's first job to future career prospects? For example, would starting in a fast food position limit job options? So while you ladies think about that, Jonathan, I'm gonna tell you my, my first paying job registered with the Social Security Bureau was corn detasseling where you actually get up at four o'clock in the morning and you walk through the corn field and you pull the tassel off the corn so that they don't cross pollinate. And now I don't even eat corn anymore, but being a corn detasseler taught me getting up early, taught me working hard, you know, and, and all of that. And I think your first job, no matter where it is, you can learn some lessons. So ladies, would you offer Jonathan any, any words that want to share with your first Social security job might have been? I would, my first social security job was a fast food job. So I would say take it. Um, I think somebody talked about grit. Um, when you look at what makes people successful, it isn't necessarily what they went to school for. Um, while that's one element, I would hire anybody who's willing to show up, work hard, and try their best and keep trying. Um, I would do that over at anybody. So um, taking jobs so you have to pay the bills, taking jobs that are fast food um, jobs, that shows you can work hard, you're committed, and that shows that you're willing to do the work, um, even if it's not the work you desire every day, um, to, to make to get to where you're at. So I, I would say take that job. Great. Anyone else? Yeah, you're, you, Nancy said it perfectly. Your career is long. It's going to have many twists and turns. What you do now is not going to determine what you're doing, going to be doing 20 years later, not even like two years later. And um, it is, there's no better way to learn about human nature than to work in the service industry. Uh, and I would just add, you never know who knows someone else. So you give that job your all and maybe your manager is at a cookout on the weekend talking to someone who's looking for a person who's this that or the other and that's you and so give it your best whatever you're doing you never know it can really make a big difference so i'm going to try to squeeze one more question in and maybe only ask one of you to respond we got about two minutes before chris is going to come on and wrap up but this one is from Justin Sewell, a UT Dallas student, and he says, why do you personally feel a large minority representation is deprived and feels like computer science? Um, from where do you think this originated? Anyone have any thoughts about that? One of you maybe? We stumped the panelist. The, the question got a little broken up for me at oh, least. Okay, so what he, what he basically is asking is, you know, Minority representation seems to be void and feels like computer science. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I think that um, at, at least in for gender, I think at certain point early on, girls opt out because they see technology as a boy thing. Um, and I think that might happen for communities of color as well. Sometimes you got to see it to be it. And if you're not really seeing it, you, you, you don't think that that's what you should be doing. 
Thank, thank you for that, Maya. So let's give a virtual round of applause to our panelists here today. Uh, Nancy, Terry, and Maya, thank you for lending us your time. Thanks to Megan for kicking us off. We are so fortunate to have your companies in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and have you leading the inclusive efforts on behalf of your organizations. I'd now like to hand it over to Chris Boddy, our Assistant Vice President for Development at UT Dallas and Associate Dean for External Affairs here in the Johnson School to share with you some next steps to stay involved at UT Dallas. Chris? Well, thank you, Dean Adams. And, and Jonathan, if I could just uh, add to that question, my first job coming, uh, ever was as a gas station attendant. I can honestly say that, um, you know, I learned a lot from that job, even more since, than some of my college classes. So, uh, so, so take that as an opportunity. So I first and foremost want to thank you all. Uh, thank, thank the panelists and speakers for your insightful comments and perspectives. I also want to thank our development team at UT Dallas who helped produce this event. You know, we have a great team here at the Johnson School, and I want to thank them for all their hard work in making this happen. So like Dean Adams mentioned, it gives me great pleasure to serve UT Dallas in my role as Assistant Vice President and Associate Dean. But I also come to you all as an alumnus from UT Dallas. And as an alum, you know, I've had the privilege to serve as a volunteer on our Diversity Advisory Council at UT Dallas, where discussions like the one we just had can be put into action across our campus. And those actions have had meaningful results and impact for our students and our community. You know, I'm very proud to mention that in 2018, UT Dallas was ranked the 11th most diverse campus for ethnic diversity in the nation, according to the US News and World Report. Also in 2020, UT Dallas ranked as one of the most inclusive and supportive universities for LGBTQ students, as we rank number 14 in the nation by best colleges. So we're very proud of the progress and the achievements that we've had. But even with our progress and our achievements, we still have a lot of work to do. And I don't think it's any secret out there that nationally, diversity lacks in the areas of engineering and computer science, whether it be in the workforce, K through 12 education, or universities alike. And thus the Johnson School of Engineering and Computer Science has its own opportunities for engagement. And that's where we need your help and how you all can get involved. One of the school's top priorities and goals is to truly become diverse, equitable for all and inclusive for all. And discussions like the one we just had, you know, I, I get very excited and it motivates me listening to this amazing panel. And I usually ask myself after discussions like this, you know, what can I do? And, and, and personally, even in my day to day, I, I rarely end a meeting without asking the question, you know, what are our next steps, right? So, so two next steps to consider that align with our values for diversity, equity, inclusion. First off, on May 25th at 4 p.m., we invite all of you to attend the launch of the New Dimensions campaign for UT Dallas. This virtual event will kick off the public campaign of our, um, of our new, new Dimensions campaign and will truly define what the next 50 years of UTD's history will look like. For the Johnson School, that definitely includes diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives across our school. And, you know, a commitment to diversity is a strategic priority for us. So keep an eye out for that link. We hope that you all can attend. And secondly, on the heels of that kickoff, we invite you to participate in the fifth annual Comets Giving Day, which will, which will take place virtually May 26th and 27th. Over the years, Comets Giving Day has become a UT Dallas tradition for alumni, students, faculty and staff, and friends of the university to come together to make a difference for our community. A top funding priority for the Johnson School is Dean Adams's diversity initiatives, which kicked off last year. And, and we're very excited about these new programs because we know that they will be transformational for our students in the Johnson School. And again, I wanna recognize Maya Lehman, who y'all just heard from, because it was through her leadership that American Airlines became one of our first corporate supporters for diversity initiatives in the Johnson School. So thank you, Maya, for your leadership and all that you and Amer American Airlines have done to impact our school and our community. So those are just two upcoming opportunities to engage with UT Dallas. Of course, there are a myriad of ways to engage and to make impact through the university. So please do reach out to any of us in the Johnson School if you wish to explore that deeper. Again, thank you to Maya, to Nancy, to Terry, and Megan for joining us. You know, these individuals are phenomenal leaders working for phenomenal companies. And it gives us great satisfaction to note that all these companies are either partners or exploring partners partnerships with the Johnson School. So we're very thankful for their support and for spending so much time with us this morning. And lastly, we appreciate them giving us so many valuable insights and tools that can make us all better ambassadors so that we can all go out and make that impact in our community. 
You know, earlier this week when we were prepping for this discussion, we met with all the uh, panelists to, to prepare. And, you know, it was our discussion with uh, uh, Nancy Flores, who, who y'all just heard from. And we were talking about what success for this event would look like, how we were going to define success. And, and you know, I love what she said. You know, she mentioned that, you know, if we can make an impact for at least one person's life on this call or, or further one person's perspective on the topic of diversity, equity and inclusion, then we can call this program a success. And, and, I, and I believe that's what happened today. And, and her perspective very much resonated with me earlier this week. And I, and I almost took that as a personal challenge. So if I can extend that personal challenge to us all, now that we've heard from these leaders, you know, let's go out there and impact our communities, carry the torch for diversity, equity, and inclusion in our respective spheres of influence, learn from each other, understand each other, value each other's differences, and by virtue of that, do some great things together in our community. Thanks again to everyone who attended, our students, our alumni, faculty and staff, corporate partners. I know there's a lot of in, in attendance today. Generous donors and supporters, thank you. And with that, we can stand adjourned. Thank you again. We look forward to seeing you all on May 25th for the New Dimensions campaign kickoff. Bye-bye.